Alright everyone, and welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater, and I am the Gallery Coordinator and Preparator at Art Starts. And uh, this week we will be exploring our second week looking at chance. So we're exploring chance for this workshop. I'm going to move these things away because it is now 11 o'clock. All right, let's get ready to explore chance. So before I get started, uh, I want to say hello and good morning to everyone and to let you know that in our chat channel, also joining us today is Leah Hoylick, who is our program manager at Art Starts. While I am conducting this workshop, my camera is pointed um, above me and so I can't actually see the chat while it's happening live. But that's why Leah is here to support me and to support you while we're making. So if you have any questions, you want to share what you're making, uh, we invite you to write in the comments. If you are making something that you want to share, as long as you have permission, um, take a picture of it and share it with us. We'd love to see what you're making. And when the workshop is all finished um, at 12 o'clock, I will pop into the chat channel and I will answer any questions that were left for me, um, as well as get to check out everything that you made along at the same time with us. So let's get started with this week's exploration of chance. So for every workshop that we do at Art Starts, um, especially for Art Starts Explorers, we always like to review our uh, three rules of Explorers, just so that we're all making and thinking um, from the same place. So the three rules of, of Explorers, the first one is, is that we're practicing respect. The way that we practice respect, and I say practice because we're not always perfect at it, right? Some, some weeks we're better at it than others. Um, and that's okay because at Explorers, we're just trying things out and we're practicing so that we can, we can learn. So we practice respect by checking in with ourselves, by checking in with each other, and that, that could be just asking how people are doing, giving people space if they need a bit of space, slowing down if somebody needs to slow down. We respect our tools by using them uh, correctly or properly or safely and putting them away when we're finished, washing them if they get dirty, and sharing them with other people we're making. And we practice respect by acknowledging the land. And so I'm coming to you um, from the stolen, unceded, ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, and in particular, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Skohomish people. And I'm trying to do my best while I have the privilege of making on these lands to be the best guest I can be while we are making together. The second rule of Explorers is that nothing is for keeps. So everything that we're going to be baking this week uh, or today, we're going to take it apart when we're finished. We're not trying to make any finished thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be a finished thing. We're just trying different ways of making. So I always encourage you to take things from the recycling bin. Really take things that nobody really cares about anymore. Go through the recycling bin because you probably don't have to ask for permission. Um, and it's great to be able to just rip and cut up things that have gone into the recycling bin. So everything that we're making, nothing is for keeps. And with nothing being for keeps, it means that there are no expectations. Sometimes when we make things with expectations, so what I mean is, is like maybe we want to draw something in particular. We have a picture in our head or we've seen a picture of the thing that we want to draw. And then we're really disappointed when it doesn't turn out the way that we had hoped or the way that it, um, it's supposed to look. Well, what we're practicing this week is that there is no supposed to. All ideas are good ideas. Whatever you want to try in this space is good. And it's even better if you can practice surprise. So ask yourself, I wonder what will happen if, and then be surprised or be excited when something happens that you didn't expect. And those, those are the things that we're trying to keep in mind today while we explore together. So all ideas are good ideas. So I'm going to put these to the side, even though they're here with us in our brains while we are going to explore. I'm just going to put them over so we've got a bit more making space. I'm going to move my little mini host and our sandwich board of chance off to the side also so we have a bit more space. And I'm going to sit down and get ready to explore chance with you. So if you had a chance to check out last week's video, either joining us live or in our archive, you know that we explored chance by warming up. Uh, by taking some words that we had written and then shaking them up like dice. And then the first word we saw, we just drew it. And so that was one way that we allowed random chance to be a part of our art making. 
We colored by chance by creating a, a document, a procedural document, where the color was listed one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we rolled a six-sided die, and that was the color that we ended up using. We also threw paper, and we made a collage just by throwing paper because we weren't placing it, we weren't being particular, just randomly however the paper fell. And then we also made a chance object by making our own dice. So if you want to check out last week's video, you can check it out at artstarts.com slash explores dash online. But this week, we're going to try something different. We're going to explore a few more chance objects. So chance objects are things like die. So that's pretty normal. We roll the die and we don't know what's going to come up. No matter how hard we want that, we want the number six to come up, it might not show up. And there are lots of different kinds of die. So last week I told you um, that there are such things as a hundred sided die. So this is, uh, this is 100 numbers that are on this die and it basically looks like a ball. And then you can roll 133. I found a, <laughs> that's funny that it says 33. I found a 33 sided die, which basically just looks like a top. That was 28. And then you've, you know, the, the, the six sided die, you're probably pretty familiar with that. I've also talked about coins, like money being a chance object, and I found a die that was kind of like that in my dice collection, where I've got a one and a two on it. So just like a coin, you could also make your own by cutting out a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper, especially if you're going in the recycling bin, right? You could make your own two-sided dice or coin where you've got um, the head or a picture on one side, and then you've got an animal or another picture on the other side, or you could go one, two, you could go A, B, you could go seven and 32. You could pick whatever size you want and you could make your own chance object like that. So these are pretty familiar. You can usually find dice as a chance object. But let's explore different ways to make a choice or to take a chance without die. And I wanted to start the session with chance braids. And so if you've ever braided um, before, then this is going to be easy and familiar. If you have never braided before, that's okay too. You can check this out. This is a great way to learn how to braid and to practice braiding. And then honestly, after practicing a few times, I guarantee you it'll go really, really fast. You'll be able to do it pretty mindlessly. I've been braiding my hair for a really, really long time, and I don't even think about it anymore when I do my braids. But at the beginning, you have to be really particular, right? So most braids, if you wanna grab uh, three pieces of string, I have six right now, but I'm gonna divide them up by color. And so we can kind of look at them like they were three strands, right? So one, two, three. And if you're following along with me, don't worry if I'm going a little fast. If you're still running and trying to find some string, this is just what I had in my studio. But maybe you've got some hair you can braid. Maybe you are with your cousin or your guardian, your neighbor, your siblings, and you can ask them if you could braid their hair. But we want to practice respect. We want to ask before we touch anybody else's hair. But you could braid hair. You could grab uh, three pieces of material. Um, but don't worry, if I'm going a little fast and you need to catch up later, that's okay. And you can just watch and then check this out later. So I've taken three strands. And basically how you braid, normally how you braid, and there's, there's probably lots of different ways, but the way that I braid is that you always take one piece and you fold it under the other. And basically that's the whole action. You fold one and you fold it under. And then you take another one and you fold it under. And you see how the middle strand always changes? So this one goes under, then this one goes under. And if I don't hold them up, I can make a really loose braid. So I'm just going to really quickly do a really loose braid. And you see, I'm going really fast because I've been braiding for a very, very long time. And you can't see my face right now, but if you'd ever been a part of my workshops, I have very long hair and I have had long hair for all my life. So I've been practicing this and so I can braid really, really, really quickly. All right. So this is not the chance part of the braid because we're just following a pattern. We're going under, over, under, over. And so it looks very uniform. It looks very same, right? You can see the red goes right, left, right, left, 
yellow goes left, right, left, right. Brown goes right, left, right, left. And it's a very, very clear pattern that you're seeing there. What I'm going to say, what I'm going to suggest now is that we're not going to follow that pattern. We are going to add an element of uh, randomness. We're going to take a, we're going to take a chance. We're not going to be sure exactly what's going to happen. And that's what, what I mean by practicing chance, because when we're following a pattern, we kind of know exactly what's going to happen. And if we're sewing or we're knitting or we're drawing a picture that is drawing something in particular, we kind of want it to follow the thing, right? We have expectations. But when we're exploring or when we want to have chance objects to help us make a decision or just to see what happens, then we don't want to follow a pattern. Okay, so still using three strands like this, instead of going over under, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. And you could do a couple of things here. You could make your own three-sided dice. You could use your own one-sided die here where this means maybe one means over or maybe the beaver on a, on a nickel means over and then head means under or two means under. And you could roll every time if you wanted to, or you could just choose whatever you feel like. It depends on how good you are at braiding. If you're, if, you, if this is the first time you've ever braided and you're a little nervous, having the die to slow down to go, okay, this means, I'm gonna write this down so I remember. <laughs> so I'm gonna go one means over and two means under. And this will require me to slow down because remember how I went so fast It's because I've been practicing braiding my whole life. I just know how easy it is to do it. But to slow down and change the rules means that I had to write it down and, and I'm going to have to think every time I make this action rather than just doing it mind, mindlessly. And that's a really good thing in art making is sometimes even if you are an expert, even if you are a pro, maybe you've been doing this since kindergarten slowing down and going, how could I change this and do this differently? Means you'll be able to learn new ways of doing and making that you wouldn't have ever tried if you'd just done the easy way that you had learned. Okay, so I'm going to do a chance braid with my coin with one and two. Remember, you could write if you had a, a piece of money and depending on the, the coin that you have there, you could go beaver, over or loon uh, or sailboat schooner whatever coin you have and then head or queen because you'll notice on the back of the, the coin especially in Canada right we've got the queen and then under and if you have another chance object again you could make your own rules you just need to have something that chooses on a binary or one two or zero one so um, so that you have those two options when you flip your coin. Okay, ready? I'm going to start on this side and I'm going to keep going from this side to this side to this side. All right, one. Okay, over. So this one goes over this strand. And then this one goes under this strand. Okay, and I'm just going to keep going. Over. Oh, and then it undoes it. And that's okay, right? We're just trying. Okay, and then this one goes under. And I'm gonna have a twist over here now. And on this side, over. Oh, two of them are working at the same time. And then over again. Right? So I'm still going back and forth. I'm still choosing the outside one back and forth so that it does braid. But you could change the rules for that as well. You could make your own chart. You could have two coins here and one that means what strand you use and how the action that you do it, right? Back on this side, under. And then under. under again. All right, it's starting to look a little bit more like a classic braid this time. And that might happen, right? Oh, over. Okay. And then under. Uh, I went on the 
this side, look at this side. Right, I had to slow down, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm undoing the braid. <laughs> and then over. And then under. Oh yeah, still undoing the braid, right? So this act of trying chance braiding, it's not gonna end up looking exactly the way that you expect it. Maybe it's not gonna look exactly the way that you normally braid. If you were doing this with your hair, you might end up with a big tango, or you may end up with a really, really cool hairstyle. You could also use this as a way to slow down if you're feeling a little bit stressed out and you just need to take your mind off of something for a second so you could really focus on the braid. There are lots of ways that you could use chance when you're doing a braid with three strands, but for people who are a little bit more expert at braiding, and feel ready to go to more strands, I'm gonna now open this up and I'm going to make six strands, right? And all I did was I cut three pieces of string and then I just folded them over here in a loop. So it's one really long string that I have here, uh, but it lets me have um, two, different, two different strands for each one. And I went yellow, red, uh, brown, yellow, red, brown, but you could, you could put them in whatever orientation you want. Well, now that we have more strands, now there's a, a greater chance that things are going to be uh, random, especially because um, this time I'm not going to just choose from the outside. I'm going to choose um, pretty random of what string that I use. So just random. I'm not going to make any decision. I'm not going to roll anything for this one. It's just going to be whatever string that I decide I'm going to pick up, but I'm still going to do the over under here with my, my die. So I'm going to start on this side over. This time I'm going to go all the way over. Just because. So I want to see what happens. Oh, over again. Okay, this time I'm going to take this one. And I'm going to go over here. Kind of hugging all the strings. This time I'm going to go under. I'm going to choose this one. And I'm going to go under like this. Okay, I'm going to go over. And I'm going to go over all the strings. Uh, over. Okay, I'm going to pick this one and same thing. I'm going to go over all the strands over here. Over. Okay, I'm going to again this one, but I'm only going to go over two strands. Because why not? Okay, over again. I'm going to do this one. No, I'm going to do this one. Change my mind and I'm allowed because we're exploring. And I'm going to go over here. And over. Just gonna go over one this time. Under, okay, I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna go all the way under these ones, all of these together. There we go. And then under, uh, oh, I'm gonna take this one. I'm gonna go under all of them here. There we go. So check it out, that does not look like a braid right? Like a traditional braid of the three strands, right? It looks kind of wild. And if I wanted to use this as a necklace or I wanted to make it as a, uh, a rope or a design that I could paste down on my painting or picture, if I wanted to try this with my hair, right? It's going to look so different. And if you've been braiding a billion different times again, this is a really fun way of trying something different and unique, right? Just because this is still braiding doesn't mean that it's gonna look the same for everybody. Even if everybody in the room was all trying braiding in this method, it's gonna look different every time. And then you could change up the colors. You could add more strands. You could add fewer strands, or sorry, take away strands. And it'll look different every time. And that's a way of exploring random, being random, chance, taking a chance and seeing what happens using braids. Okay, so that was one chance object. Put this to the side. I'm not even going to unbraid anything. I'm just going to go. All right. Move this one to the side. All right, so then I'm going to try out uh, a fortune teller. You may have made one of these before. This is this is a paper folding object that you uh, can find online, the instructions online. I'll unfold this right now and show you how I did it. 
it's one of the very simple ways of folding paper. Um, sometimes you'll also see it online as an origami, which is the Japanese art of paper folding, as a candy dish, right? So a little bit. Ooh. <laughs> there we go. Now it's balanced and it's all over, right? So there you go. Now it's a candy dish, right? So if you find the instructions for uh, the Japanese paper folding origami candy dish, what you can do is you can just flip it over and then it becomes this object. And you maybe have played this before, but if this is the first time you've seen it, I'll show you how to play with it. But I'm gonna start by unfolding it and make one along with you. Um, and again, don't worry if I'm going a little fast in the video, you can always come back and check out this video after I'm done live, and then you'll be able to pause and go back and scrub the video to be able to find what you need. But also, you, if you went online, if you, have, uh, if you have access to a search engine, then you can type in um, paper folding instructions, fortune teller, or candy dish. I really like the instructions for paper folding on instructables.com, which is an open source uh, website with lots of pictures. Um, and so you can go nice and slow to fold your, um, to fold your fortune teller. Okay, so what's the first thing that you notice about my piece of paper here? It is square. And it's probably pretty easy to tell that on my cutting mat here, right? Uh, because you can see the grid behind it. And so what I did was I took a piece of computer paper, which was eight and a half by 11, so eight and a half by 11, and I wanted it to be uh, square. So what I did was, was I folded it from this end, here, I'll move this over here, from this end over here, so the long edge is facing up and down. I took this side and I brought it over to the spine over here. And you see how all this extra stuff here is? This is the part of the rectangle that I don't want because I want it to be square. And so what you could do now is, is you could take a piece, uh, you could take some scissors and you could cut off this excess or extra paper. What I always do is, is because I don't want to grab my scissors, I just fold this part over here. And with paper, if you stress it, either using your fingernails or just folding it lots and lots and lots, lots of time. You could also put some water on your finger if you needed to and then run it along the spine there to make the paper a little bit weaker. And I always want to suggest that you use a little bit of water and not uh, not your mouth. Sometimes you'll see people they'll run their their tongue along the side because they want to do that and um, I mean that's their choice but this is paper and if you've ever had a paper cut you really don't want a paper cut on your tongue so that doesn't feel so great. Also, we're trying to practice respect for people and saliva, the things that are in our mouth, we want to keep things out of our mouth, right? We don't want to share our germs, especially during this time where people are trying to be really concerned about our health and safety. So rather than licking um, the side, just get some water or just keep folding it back and forth. And if you've always licked the side before, that's okay. That's all right. That's, that, that's something that you did, but maybe uh, in the future, you want to consider changing it up, trying something different, trying a different way. Okay, so I folded this back and forth lots of times. It's gonna just come apart, right? It's just gonna rip real, real easy. Right, there you go. And so when I unfold this, you'll see, ta-da, I've got a square, right? So that's a really easy way of turning a rectangle um, into a square so that you can make this paper folding activity. All right. So one of the first things you want to do when you're making a fortune teller is you want to make some creases. So start by folding the paper in half. Take the bottom up to the top, fold it in half, and then unfold it. And then rotate the paper and do that same thing again. Fold it in half, push down the edges so that you have a nice crease in that way. Then flip the paper over. And we're going to do that again, only this time we're going to only rotate it 45 degrees so that the points are sticking towards you and away from you. And then we're going to do that same thing, but this time we're going to make that point meet that point. And then fold it in half. Awesome. Unfold it. And then we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 90 degrees. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to do it that point to that point.
there we go. Okay, so now that we've unfolded it, you should have a crease that goes, uh, it makes an X or a cross that touches all of the points. And then when you fold it this way, you have one that folds the paper in half and holds the paper in half again. Okay, so now that that is done, we've got all these nice marks on our paper. We're gonna put it back on the direction um, where we had the folds this way and this way. So the point, so the side where it makes it easy for you to fold the bottom up to the top. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna fold it. <clears throat> oh, sorry, we're not gonna fold it in half. Now we're gonna fold it in half again. So based on this halfway line, you're gonna take this bottom part, and you're gonna bring it up to the center. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit faster through these steps now because I want to explore this and and this ends up being uh, something that you can check out online. And for those people who have already made a fortune teller before, they'll probably be working through this pretty quickly. And so don't worry if I'm going a little fast. You can always pause the video later or just check out what I'm doing this time and then try it yourself. So I've taken all the edges all together and then I'm gonna flip it over. And then same as before, I'm going to take that halfway mark into the center and you can see where you have folded. It makes all these nice crease lines that you can see. And that's it. That's all the folding you need to do because now when you fold it in half, all you need to do is pinch your fingers underneath the flaps of paper and then push them together like this and it makes the fortune teller. So again, if it's not working, you're a little frustrated, you need to slow down for a second, or my instructions were too fast, you can find lots and lots of instructions for um, paper folding fortune tellers online. Okay, so now we're gonna explore some chance with this. If you have another friend with you, fortune tellers are really fun because what you can do is you can um, put all this information inside the fortune teller and then you can ask a friend to pick um, all these different sides. But if we're by ourselves, we want to also be able to play this um, as a chance object, right? You don't need another friend to roll a die. So how can you use a fortune teller to decide or to make decisions or to bring chance into your uh, art making? So what I'm going to do is instead of uh, what you usually see is people will put colors on the outside of their, um, of their fortune teller, but instead of coloring it with the color, I'm going to write out the word. So I'm going to go R E D. And then in this, I'm going to go three. And I did that because the number of letters in R E D or in red is one, two, three. And so I now have this side that says that has the number three, right? And then I'm going to do it again this side and I'm gonna go pink one two three four so I'm gonna keep going like that orange Six, what's another one? Maybe green. G R E D E N, which is one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So now I have all these numbers. So as I said before, if you have a friend with you, if you have your uh, guardian, if you have your foster parent, you can go up to them and you can go, hey, pick a color. And they can go, oh, I pick red. And then you can go one, two, three. But if you're by yourself and you've got some of these handy objects here, right? What you could do is you could go, oh, well, I don't know what color I want to use next. Maybe you're coloring uh, a picture or maybe you're painting or maybe you're trying to decide what color of shirt to wear today. Well, you can do it like if you die and go two. Nope, I don't have any twos. Roll again. Six. Oh, 
orange. Done. You're going to pick an orange shirt today. What we're going to do is we're going to go a little deeper with our fortune teller, and we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Orange. And so the next step of the fortune teller is that we're going to open this up, and we're going to write some messages on the inside here. And so for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go draw. Paint pencil uh, and then what am I going to do for the last one? Last one I'm going to do a uh, string. So now the fortune teller becomes a creativity design, right? So now you're not sure what you want to do. You want to be creative or you want to challenge your friend to try something creative. So now you can go, all right, pick a color and they pick pink. You go P I N K. And facing me, so even though you above can see both of these here, I'm looking this direction. So for me, I'm picking string. But maybe you decide that if you're uh, playing with somebody else, so they have picked pink and they can see this side. So for them, they're going to play with paint and I'm going to play with string. All right, so then you can go one more level if you want. So what you could do is, is that same as before, the number of letters that you see on the outside, R, E, D. Now you could go draw is D, R, A, W. So maybe this side is four and pencil, P, E, N, C, I, L. So six for pencil, depending on which one you, you picked, I'm going to pick draw, so D, R, A, W. What you could do is go, oh, well, it's the same thing this time. So maybe you draw twice, or maybe you draw with pencil, or maybe you paint with string. So there are lots of different ways that you could read however you make this. You could make lots of different fortune tellers, and you could try and write different things. So this is a game you could play with dice. This is a game you could play with your friends or with uh, a guardian or parent. This is something that you could just play by yourself and just decide uh, today maybe the first color you see. Or again, the clothing, maybe what color your socks are, right? So there are lots of ways that you could code all of this, but it's still taking an element of chance because you're not 100% sure what you're going to pick, especially if you're changing the rules all the time. So that's another way of playing with chance. And there are lots of ways that you can play with a fortune teller, right? These are all blank. So just like last week when we put tape over the different sides of the die, which means that you can choose what each side of the die means to you. When this was blank, when this was just by itself, you could pick whatever you wanted to put on the outside. You get to decide. And if you make a bunch of these and then share them with your friends, you could take a chance on which one you choose each day, right? Maybe, maybe one day you choose one that has animals that you wrote on side, inside of it. Maybe one, it's all colors. Maybe another time it's um, the different, oh, uh, maybe, maybe what you do is, is you, you define that one is for pencil crayons and one is for crayons. And so you're gonna play with pencil crayons and crayons but then you ask your object which color you're going to use next of which, of which object before you, you make. So there's lots of ways that you can define how you're going to use these chance objects. Okay, this one's going to be really, really small. And then, I mean, that's a new challenge as well. What can you fit in these tiny little spaces, right? So for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go happy face. Sad face, and then I'm going to go angry face, and then I'm going to go surprised face. So eyebrows up really high, full for mouth. All right, and so all of a sudden this becomes a emotion fortune teller, or a practice faces in the mirror fortune teller, 
or a picture game where somebody has a camera and depending on which face you make, that's, that's what you choose. Or maybe you put the faces on the inside of it. Or maybe you choose one of the faces and you assign names to it, right? You can put whatever you want on any of these sizes, sides when you make your own uh, chance object. Okay, so we got two of those. Here we go. Now my little buddy has a funny hat. Let's try something else. Okay, so that was fortune tellers. Next, I'm going to take a chance with water. All right, so whenever I play with water, and, um, and in this case, I'm going to choose water and paint, I always want to make sure that I have a nice clean surface um, and that I have prepared to make a little bit of a mess. So whether that's you're going to put out some um, newsprint or uh, you're going to work in the kitchen so it's easy to clean up, Whatever you're going to do, whenever we're acting with uh, paint, we always want to be a little bit more mindful and careful so that we're not making a big old mess that, um, that somebody else has to help us clean up. Okay, so I've got this piece of paper here. And water is a great example of a chance object because you can't really tell water what to do. You can try. If we use a spray bottle, right, we determine where the water is going to go depending on where we point the nozzle. If we close our eyes when we're working with water, there's going to be a greater chance that we're not necessarily going to know exactly where it is, but when we had our eyes open, we know that the paper is in front of us at the very least. But if we're playing with a friend and they move the piece of paper and you spray it in front of you, then you're not gonna hit the paper, right? So there's all these elements at play and we can practice as much control or as little control as we want, right? So if I spray this page, I didn't choose for that spray of water to be there. I didn't choose for that spray of water to be there. And so, so uh, because I didn't wet the whole page, I really only have, have these places to practice or to play with water. And I didn't choose that. I, it just happened. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my paintbrush and add some water. And I have these very messy paints here because I'm constantly playing with, uh, with paints. And yours are probably cleaner than mine. And don't worry, if your palette's a little dirty, especially when we're exploring, that's okay, right? Because we don't know 100% what colors are going to happen because we have these messy palettes. And that's cool too, right? So now what I'm gonna do, I put a little bit of paint, I put a little bit of um, water back on my brush and I'm just gonna hold it over top of the page. Not really controlling at all where this water or this paint goes, right? And I can put more water so that it drips more heavily. Or I could just put a little bit of water. Right? So before, I, I controlled where the spray was just because I wanted the spray to be here and here, but I didn't control where the droplets were. This one I controlled what color I put on my brush, and not 100% because I had a really messy palette here, but I kind of did. Like, I, I picked this kind of messy, whitey brown color, but if I had gone over to the purple, I would have made that choice. What I didn't make the choice was is that when I added water to it, how much would drip where? And even though I'm gonna bring my arm over to this corner over here, I can't really control how much water or how much paint is going to happen, right? And so I'm just going to see what happens while I add different colors and uh, some water to this paper. So I'm going to add a couple of different colors here. And if you don't have any paint, but you do have water, that's cool too. Just take a piece of paper and a paintbrush, and if you don't have a paintbrush, if you have an old toothbrush, or you can use your finger, right? And just drip the water down with your finger. But the paint for me is more so that you can see it, right? It's gonna be easier for you to see through my camera, um, through the camera, to be able to see what I'm doing. 
But absolutely, there's no reason for you to be uh, worried that you can't follow along just because you don't have paints. Just playing with water, right? I don't know exactly where it's going to fall. And the other cool thing about playing with chance and water is that when this dries, you can do it all over again. So you can check out if the water stains the page, what happens. You could ask uh, some, you could, um, if somebody is cooking in your household, um, what I like to do is, one of my favorite things is to make ink. <clears throat> and I make some ink out of cabbage. And the way that I do that is I take the cabbage and I boil it. And then the water that is left behind, it has a color to it. So if somebody in your household is cooking carrots or any kind of vegetable, really, you could ask them if they could save you a little bit of water, put it in the fridge so it cools down, because you don't want it to be hot. Usually when you're cooking vegetables, it's hot. Put it in the fridge and then pull it out, take out your piece of paper, and then see what different kinds of vegetable water make different colors on the page to see what happens. Right, so you don't have to have paints to be able to do this. You could have vegetable water. You could take a piece of paper to the park and have a spray bottle and you could make some mud, right? You could put, you could put some water with some mud, you could put your finger in the mud and then you could spray it on the page. Check out what the mud does to the page, right? You don't need to have fancy paints to explore with water. Okay, so I'm gonna add just a few more over here just so we can see the different colors. I'm not even being very careful about the water getting dirty because I don't really, I'm not trying to be particular, right? We're just trying to see what happens. We have no expectations. If I had expectations, I probably would be disappointed if the color was going to blend together or if I was making this with another friend at the same time and they picked a color I didn't really like. It doesn't really matter this time because we're not trying to make something we like. We're just trying to see what happens if. And by practicing with a friend or a guardian or a teacher or your grandparents, them trying something else that you didn't think of before is going to lead you to learn more things together faster than if you were exploring on your own. Oh, that didn't quite work that time. So check it out, right? I'm not making decisions other than what color to pick when. So I only picked a bit of water this time. And there we go. So that was completely random, right? I didn't plan any of that. I didn't decide, but in the end, it turns out really cool. Check out how the blue is kind of moving through this color. Yeah, and I wouldn't, if I had had to try and make this exact shape, it probably wouldn't turn out as cool or as organic here as if I had just taken my paintbrush and tried it. So uh, for me, what I like to do is, is that, uh, you know how you're supposed to change your toothbrush um, often, especially when the color changes, right? So that we always have a, a nice clean toothbrush. Um, what I will do is, is that when my toothbrushes uh, are no longer good for my teeth, is that I will wash them. And what I do is, is I take uh, an old toothbrush and I put it in some vinegar and I usually put it there for, I don't know, an hour. And then I'll just take some soap and then I'll just run it through the bristles I'll let it dry and then I add it to my paint box. And I really like um, paintbrushes, or sorry, yeah, toothbrushes when it comes to uh, painting and chance drawing because you can kind of control it just like the spray bottle where you've got that circle nozzle and you spray it and you kind of know that it's going to happen in a circle. Or if you don't know, check it out. That's especially cool when you're trying with water. If you don't know what something's going to look like first, take a piece of paper that is not your final project and just see what happens when you do it. Once you learn how a thing acts, then you can bring it into your art making when you're making your finished project and you're really confident because you already know what's going to happen. This is the time to explore. This is the time to see what's gonna happen if I. Okay, so I was talking about toothbrushes. So what I really like about toothbrushes is that it is really random. You can only kind of control what's gonna happen. And so I took this paintbrush and I just put, or the toothbrush, and I'm just going to pick up some of these colors here. And that ended up being kind of cool as well. I wasn't even planning that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my other hand 
and you can do this with a piece of paper. You could do this with um, a rag that you've got permission. You could put some plastic containers around because you just don't want, don't want it to go everywhere. And this can be very messy. So make sure you get permission before you start uh, working with toothbrushes. This is also a fun project that, remember how I told you, um, try making with mud? You could take some mud and an old toothbrush and you could go outside and you could uh, use some, um, some mud and water and try this as well uh, where there's nobody around, right? Because you want to make sure nobody's in front of you because you don't want to get anything in their eyes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to run it along the toothbrush like this. Check it out. Right? And so it makes this really cool spray pattern. And so as I said before, with the control, I know that the spray will kind of happen in this direction if I point my, point, my paintbrush like this. But what happens when you try it in different directions? What happens when you don't use your pointer finger? What happens when you use your thumb? And always point it away from you, right? You notice I didn't go like this, and so I'm sitting over, over here. I didn't point it in this direction. And even though I've got my little friend over here who's made of cardboard, so it's okay that I pointed it at them. Generally, if you're gonna be painting or playing with the toothbrush, you're gonna to wanna to ask them if they could come over to the side or if they could just put on an apron and get out of the way for it because you don't wanna get paint on somebody who you don't mean to get paint on, right? Hopefully you don't get your paint, paint on anybody, even if they do want paint on them because that can be dangerous. So. Again, I'm just randomly going around, not really thinking about it because that's okay. We were just trying something random up here. And I, again, I've got a bit on here. I'm going to point it away from me and I'm going to spray. Cool. Right? Don't really know what's going to happen, but it adds a bunch of interesting texture that we weren't expecting. Okay, there's one other way I wanted to practice with chance and water. Again, you can be doing all of this with just water. You do not have to have paint. It can be really interesting with just water or mud. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another piece of paper. I'm going to move this paper out of the way because I want it to dry. It will dry pretty quick. There's not a lot of water on it. And I'm going to put this piece underneath here and now I'm going to lift it up. And now this first painting, this first picture, becomes a paintbrush, right? On a paintbrush, you can't really control. So this is just me holding it above the page, but what happens if I touch it to the page? What happens if I smear it on the page? Oh yeah, look at that, I really like that. I was not expecting that purple or blue to happen like that. But now what I can do is I can let all of these things dry and these can be the base or the bottom or the background of a whole new drawing. So if each one of these dry and then you check it out later, you could go, oh, well these kind of look like tree trunks here and this kind of looks like a multicolored forest and then you can color on top of it. Maybe in this multicolored forest there's a blue moon and a pink moon. Or maybe there are bubbles that are coming out. Maybe these are all bubbles. Maybe when we turn the page around, it looks like something completely different. So I'm going to let these all dry for the last 10 minutes of our session and see what they look like at the end. But that's, that's a way of playing with chance and water, saying, what will happen if I, and then just add these kind of random elements to it to see what happens. Okay, so that's a chance with water. Put that over to the side and let it dry a little bit. This is also a great way of, if you, uh, if you don't know what you want to draw, if you make a whole bunch of these chance drawings um, with water and then you let them dry and you put them to the side, next time you're bored, next time you want to try a picture, you've got all these cool backgrounds and bases that you can pull out and you can cut them up. You could use them as backgrounds. You can use them as paintbrushes, right? We just showed how you can use a paper as a paintbrush just by dragging it across the page. So all of these objects can now be reused 
in new things that you make. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes, what I wanted to show you was um, an alternate to dice, but to inspire placement on a page. Okay, so whether you have, um, if, if you can access some dice, or if you maybe have a bag of beads, right? Or maybe you've got some um, dolls that have shoes or accessories, or maybe you've got a whole bunch of toy cars, or maybe you've got some, you can go looking for different color rocks in your backyard. There are a whole bunch of things that you can find that are not dice, but that will fit in your hand that when you shake them and throw them, they fall in a way that you can't necessarily predict. And so I'm going to do two different pictures right now, just with, um, with dice and with beads, because that's what I had in my apartment. But, but you could choose anything. You could pick crayons, and you could pick up the crayons, and you could just let them fall on a piece of paper and then find out where the, where the paper moves. Here, you know what, I'm gonna do three. I've got some pencil crayons here, I'm gonna do the same thing. Because remember, I'm not planning before this workshop too. I, just like you, I'm just trying out different things using chance. And so I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen before I try out any of these things. I just pull a bunch of things from my studio and then I see what's going to happen as we explore the theme. And because of that, that means I encourage you too, if you wanted to make your own Explorers workshop, you could just take any of the ideas that I have here and you could make up your own activities. Make up your own rules. Ask your guardian or your parent or your sibling or your neighbor to come over and explore together and come up with your own rules. Maybe one day somebody is wearing a bracelet and you decide that you're going to incorporate that bracelet into your art making. Maybe one day somebody has painted nails and whatever color their painted nails are, that's the color that you're going to draw everything with. Whatever rules you make up to explore can be really exciting and interesting and unique. And you get to make the rules because there's no expectation. So whatever happens is a good idea. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all three of these objects and I'm going to just toss them on the page. And you saw how the beads really moved around, so I'm going to be kind of particular with that, but I'm going to lift them up a little bit and then drop them on the page. And this one might be a little, little messy and chaotic. Okay, oh yeah, it's falling all over the place. Oh, my cat's going to enjoy that later. All right, I'm going to do this again. Try and, oh, and that's cool. I'm just kind of going wherever. Oh yeah, it's it's a it's a wild mess over here, and that's cool. You know what? I'm gonna put them all on the page because I'm just making up rules as I go along. And I'm gonna shake them a little, see what happens there. All right, that's a little bit more controlled. That's a little bit better, so I don't have to mess around with beads a little bit later. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna leave. Actually, I'm gonna shake it a little bit more. I want it to be a little bit more random. <laughs> It ends up being harder than I think, right? But depending on the beads you have, if you have nice flat beads, they'll probably be easier. Yeah, see, easier to toss if you have nice flat beads. If you have a lot of, a lot of round beads, they're probably going to go all over the place. And if you're not the one who does the vacuuming, you probably don't want to do that because that's going to make a mess for somebody later. I really want these to hit the page. One more time, one more time. Okay, that's good enough. All right, so that's random with beads. Now let's go random with pencil crayons. So I'm gonna hold them like this. <laughs> and I'm gonna see what happens, right? Hopefully you'll put a little bit more distance if you're gonna do two beside each other. Okay, so I've decided I'm gonna hold them like that. There you go. So it's probably not really clear in the, in the picture, but, or in your video, because um, it's not very zoomed in. But I have a bunch of dots now on the page from where the pencil crayons came in. Next I'm going to do is I'm going to just randomly sort the color combination and now I'm going to draw with these pencil crayons. Alright. Right? I 
didn't pick the orientation. I did pick the colors but I didn't really pick where it went. And so from this now, I've got this random drawing that I can, I can use as the base of my picture. Okay, I kind of see a face here. And I kind of see a torso or a body right there. And you know, it kind of feels like they're dancing because of all of this movement here. So I'm gonna bring some arms up here. And maybe one leg is like this. Oh, there's the other leg right there. And there we go. Okay, you know what? I can kind of see a smile through these lines that it made here. Oh, and kind of an eye here. And there we go. So just by using a bunch of random pencil crayons that I pulled together, and I, I still like the dots. It kind of looks like music notes in action around the outside. I wasn't expecting that. And then just by randomly coloring on the page, I got this idea that I wasn't planning beforehand. And so that's some random stuff with pencil crayons. Okay, and now I'm gonna choose the die to hit the page. I wanted to see if I can get all of them on the page. One more, come on. Oh, <laughs> I knocked one off. Okay. All right, that's good enough. Okay, so for this, again, I can make my own rules here. I could look at these as just objects. So this by itself being an object, I could look at them as the numbers and I can make decisions based on the numbers. I think because this is way up here, I think I just wanna treat this as a sun. It's kind of up in the sky, right? It's away from these things. But because there's the number three there, dark. I'm going to add three beams of light around the outside of it, right? Because there was a three there. And then I'm going to choose uh, this one right here, the four. Oh, there's four and four. So I'm going to do four bumps on a mountain. One, two, three, four. So those are my four there. And I'm gonna add these little snow peaks. There we go. And then this one right here, I'm gonna decide that it's a river and that there are two bends in the river. There's a two there. One, two. So there's my river, two bends. Some shade on that. There we go. And then over here, I'm gonna draw Brown, brown pencil. Go. I'm going to draw three trees. One, two, three. It's kind of funny trees where the green is just at the top, really high up. Okay, that's fine. Because it doesn't matter. I'm just trying things out. It doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to be a finished picture. It doesn't even have to be something you like. Right? That's, that's the funny thing about exploring is, is that sometimes when you color with people, sometimes when you're in um, an art class or at school and you're coloring, it's going to be somebody who everybody says is really good. They're doing really good. And it might, you might hear other people say something like, oh, I can't draw as good as that other person. And I can't change how you feel when, when that happens. But what I can do is encourage you that when we're making like this, it's not about being good or bad. In fact, it can be really fun when you're exploring and you're not making a finished product, a finished picture, a finished thing, to, or to try and practice being as bad as you can at drawing as possible. Especially if you're really good at something, try to draw it badly. How is it different? How do you feel when you try and draw something bad compared to when you're trying to draw something really good. How does it feel to draw with somebody who's really, really good at something and tell them to draw really bad and they struggle, right? It might be that you can encourage somebody who, who thinks that they're really good at something, who knows they're really good at drawing something, 
And then you encourage them to try and be, to do it badly. And they might struggle because they want it to be good. This is a skill that you can practice to just try and do something and not be afraid, not be worried about how it turns out and be fearless, be brave in your, in your art making because it's not about good or bad. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to do, I'm gonna take my pencil crayons again and I'm gonna use the beads. So in this, in this case, I'm not gonna actually draw a finished picture. I'm just gonna use the beads to kind of inspire me. I'm just gonna look at the beads and I'm gonna draw whatever I think of. And then I look at the beads. And yours are gonna look completely different and if I threw them, they would probably look completely different again. But if you just wanted to draw something, if you just wanted to try, oh, well, that's fine. I'm gonna keep going. Because remember, we're not making a perfect finished thing. So it doesn't matter if I accidentally knock the page. It doesn't matter if somebody else knocks the page. It doesn't matter if your cat comes along and walks across the page. It doesn't matter if your uncle later in the day cleans everything up because nothing we're doing is for keeps. And you know what, you can also, you can also move things around, right? There's no rules. I just took that bead and I put it at the end of my pencil crayon. Oh, and now it doesn't want to let go. And I'm going to, I'm going to use this bead here because why not? But I'm not going to be too, I'm not going to be too precious about it. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to place these beads exactly in a perfect position. I just want to see what happens if I just keep responding to the beads that are on the page. And I could just keep going. I could do this forever, especially if the beads just keep moving around the page. Okay, so we are at 12 o'clock. Today, we explored chance braids, where we took our braid and we just randomly chose which strands to braid when to see what would happen. We made a fortune teller today and we picked whatever we wanted to put around the outside edges. We took a chance with water and it's not quite dry yet, but it's starting to get dry. We didn't plan anything. We just let the water or the, or the paint fall wherever we, wherever we wanted. And now you also know that you have my my permission, but you need somebody else's permission before you're going to get messy and dirty, but to go out and grab some mud and make that your paint, right? Always make sure you wash your hands and wash up real good after you, after you do it, but mud is a great way of exploring um, without having to use paint, right? So we explored with water, and then in the end, we explored by tossing or throwing things without really making a, without making a decision beforehand just saw what happens. And so that concludes my session on chance. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I really, really enjoyed uh, working on chance these past two weeks. When this video is all finished, I'm going to archive it. That means save it. And then I'm going to add some subtitles or some captions so that um, people can follow along with the words. Um, and next week is our, se our season finale, our summer season finale. We're going to be exploring circles. So I would love it if you could join us next or two Saturdays from now at 11, because next Saturday we are going to have a performance in our gallery. Um, and we would love to have you there. It will be a free performance starting at 11 a.m. So check out our Facebook feed for, for more information about that. Uh, I think Leo will probably throw a link up to the event. I'm not 100% sure if the event is there, so that's why I'm not giving away too many spoilers. But we'd love to see you next week. I'll be there at 11 a.m. and then the week after that, we'll be exploring circles. So as normal, I'm going to leave the video running for an extra five minutes while I clean up because I always wanna make sure we prioritize cleaning up at the end, um, recycling everything. I'm gonna throw things into the recycling bin that I can't use anymore. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for making along uh, with me this week.